Good morning once again. So sorry you guys sat down. I'm going to have you stand right back up. <laughs> Let's uh, remain standing as we read God's Word. If you have your outline with you, we are going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. God's word reads, Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We just ask for your truth that are found in these six verses. Uh, help us to be more in the likeness of your Son. Help us to remember who we are in the face of persecution and the struggle, especially within spiritual warfare. Father, we lift your name on high. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Before we get into today's study, I did, did want to read something to you from John Calvin. And it's in regards, if you looked at the title of our, of our study for today, it is the spiritual warfare of the church. And so John Calvin had this to say. As we have been forewarned that an enemy relentlessly threatens us, an enemy who is very is the very embodiment of the rash boldness of military prowess, of crafty wiles, of untiring zeal and haste, of very conceivable weapon and of skill in the science of warfare. We must then bend every effort to this goal that we should not let ourselves be overwhelmed by carelessness or faint-heartedness. But on the contrary, with, cur with courage rekindled, stand our ground in combat, since this military service ends only at death. Let us urge ourselves to perseverance. This is from John Calvin, found in the Institutes of the Christian Religion. And so, one thing that we must realize is we are constantly in a spiritual battle. Uh, it's bad enough that we have to rage war against our own flesh, but as we do that, we are also raging war against spiritual warfare, anything that comes against the truth of the gospel and against our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that's the reason why we will be in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. You may be thinking this is an odd place to start, uh, and you may be right. It might be a little bit odd. So because it might be, I figured I'd give you a little bit of a background in regards to what is going on here in the church in Corinth. A little bit of what's going on is that there have been <clears throat> some serious problems that have arose within the church in Corinth. Uh, sin has run absolutely rampant through the entire church, which is unfortunate because this is a church which is extremely talented and gifted, and yet sin has been overpowering them for quite some time. It actually prompts the Apostle Paul to write the first letter to them which is also actually a pretty severe letter. Worse, worse than this is that uh, false apostles have also risen up and created chaos in the form of false teachings. <coughs> Although through church tradition, we don't know exactly what those false teachings were. We do know that they were false apostles because according to the text, that's exactly what Paul labels them as. They look to destroy Paul's reputation and they brought false accusations against the apostle Paul. And so as they were doing this, they were doing this with one thing in mind. They were doing this because they wanted to remove the authority of Paul out of the way, and they wanted to take over 
and bring their own false teaching. This then prompted another letter to the church known as the severe letter. This is actually referred to in 2 Corinthians 2, 3 through 4. And this letter brought many to repentance in the congregation. As a matter of fact, it was great news because Titus brought this report that the majority of the congregation in the church in Corinth had repented of their sins. And that was great news. Unfortunately, that other letter was not found to be part of the canon of scripture, but nevertheless, there was a severe letter. This severe letter, letter caused many false teachers to leave and take their gatherings underground somewhere else. They left the church and they waited for the best opportune time to bring those false teachings back against Paul. So, Paul knowing this, that these false teachers were still out there, even in a minimal way, aimed a seek and destroy mission to weed out all these false apostles toward them in the defense for the Corinth church and the truth. And so this lands us exactly here in chapter 10. As a matter of fact, chapter 10, 11, 12, and 13 is aimed at these false apostles. And you'll quickly see, if you turn with me if in, in your main text here, verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. This is where Paul brings back this warfare analogy. And we must understand that we are constantly in a war against things that are spiritual, especially those things that have come against the truthfulness of the gospel. Uh, this is not something new in regards to Paul's letter and vocabulary. We actually see this found in other epistles. For example, in 1 Corinthians 9, 7, Paul refers, as, uh, at, refers to us as serving as a soldier for Christ. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2, he refers to as suffering hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy, he implores Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. To fight the good fight of faith. <clears throat> so if you look at your outline, I've broken these verses really into three parts. Uh, verses 1 and 2 can be considered as the scolding. It's actually a rebuke, but it's a rebuke in meekness. So 1 and 2 are considered to be the scolding. Uh, verses 3 and 4 is the struggle. This is what we'll get into the spiritual warfare against the church. And then finally, verses 5 and 6 have to do with the submission to Christ. The submission to Christ. So let's take a look at the first two verses here. It says, Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I need not to be bold with confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. Very interesting. Uh, in verse 1, he says, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. There was this accusation against the Apostle Paul, basically saying that look how bold he is when he is so far away from us. But yet when he's writing to us, he is so bold but yet when he's here and he's face to face, oh, he is so meek. They're actually, in a very bad, terrible sense, they're mistakenly, his, they're mistaking his meekness for weakness. And unfortunately, that is not the case. But yet, right out of the gates, Paul is urging them to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ and his meekness. Again, he was being accused of being weak when he was there face to face. Now, again, the Apostle Paul had every right to defend his apostleship, and immediately, instead of doing so, right away, he urges these insubordinate professing Christians to be submitted under the meekness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Interestingly enough, the word meekness comes from a Greek word, protas. It actually is defined as those free from anger, hatred, bitterness, and a desire for revenge. It denotes not weakness, but rather a better understanding of the word meek is power that is under control. Power that is under control. Another way to identify this person is a person who has a lot of self-control. A lot of self-control. So as a matter of fact, meekness is a characteristic of a genuine believer. 
right? When we have opportunities to react a certain way, we don't because we let those things be taken care of by our Lord, right? We don't react the way we used to. As a matter of fact, Matthew 5, 5, our Lord talks about meekness. In the Beatitudes, he says, blessed are the gentle, the meek. That's actually the same root word that we get meek from, cross. Gentle are the gentle, the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. They will inherit the earth. Turn with me to Psalm, to the Psalms. Psalm 37, 11. This is not a new teaching whatsoever. This is actually a characteristic of one who truly seeks after God. Psalm 37, 11 says, but the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in the abundant and abundant prosperity. The humble will inherit the land. Very similar language to what's going on in Matthew 5, 5. And again, our meekness brings, brings forth a blessing from God, right? There's always a blessing that is attached to meekness. Uh, turn with me to the book of Galatians. This is also a byproduct of one who is truly saved, who is, who is being moved and controlled constantly by the Holy Spirit. This is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 26. God's Word reads, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, there's that word again, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. That's exactly what Paul is doing. He is actually taking a step back and being meek about this entire thing because there, he knows there's a timing for everything. Now, Paul relied heavily on what was considered to be weak. Again, these false apostles thought that he was just a weak apostle, unfortunately. But there's also another rebuke in regards to that. Uh, turn back with me to 2 Corinthians and we're going to go now to chapter 12. Again, as I mentioned, uh, verses 10, uh, chapters 10, 11, 12, and 13 are aimed directly at these false apostles. He is really seeking out and trying to destroy these ideologies that are being built upon and against the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul relied, relied heavily on what was considered to be weakness, right? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Verses uh, 7 through 10, <clears throat> he has this to say. He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the, flesh, in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might lead me. And he, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Then I am strong. And as Christians, we ought to live by that example. It is... We, we, we are not to lean on our own understanding and our own boldness, but rather on the boldness and the strength that can only come from our Lord, Jesus Christ. This example of meekness was manifested in no one else but our Lord in our Lord Jesus Christ. And for us to follow that example, uh, turn with me to 1 Peter to get a glimpse of the meekness of our Lord. 1 Peter chapter 2.
1 Peter 2. Let's take a look at 19 through 23. Peter writes here, For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there when, you're, when you sin and are harshly treated? You endure it with patience? But if when you do, do what is right and suffer for what you patiently endure, you endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Again, our Lord, as he was being led to the cross, and he was being spit on and beaten, you know, he, did he have the power to stop all of it? Absolutely. And yet he didn't because the goal was the salvation of all those who come to believe. Brethren, that is, that is power under control. That is the example of meekness that we ought to follow. Uh, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. <clears throat> Matthew 23. see a little bit of this lament over Jerusalem from our Lord in Matthew 23 verse 37 he says Jerusalem Jerusalem who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling you were unwilling yet you see this compassion come forth from our Lord and yet we see the perfect example of our Lord's meekness. You know, the false apostles had uh, made a, a huge miscalculation in regards to consider in regards to considering Paul weak, as stated in verse two, back in our main text in Second Corinthians ten, of our main text. Paul says, "I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous." He does not need to be bold in front of them. He wants to withhold some of that, that authority that the Lord has given him. And he has every right to really come forth and rebuke these, these apostles. In a sense, he does, but he does it with compassion. This is the attitude of someone who is meek, someone who has the power but is also under control. There's a huge miscalculation here. Paul is not weak whatsoever. And we know that because when it comes to the gospel and the standing firm of the truthfulness of the gospel... He is extremely fierce when it comes to that. This fierceness of Paul we actually see when he's proclaiming the gospel in Acts 23, right? When he's proclaiming this gospel before the Jewish San Sanhedrin in Acts 23, we also see this when he brings this upon the Roman governors in Acts 24. Uh, he brings this to King Agrippa in Acts 26. And again, get a, pay attention here. He actually brings the same convictions when he is rebuking the leader of the apostles, Peter himself. And we see that in Galatians chapter 2. So one thing we know for sure, you do not want to face the apostle Paul when the gospel is being threatened and when the truth is being questioned. We know that this is all about the truth of the gospel. Now Paul was able to endure many attacks against himself, but when those attacks turned and now they went towards the gospel, we know that Paul became a very different person. We understand that. And friend, we must be that as well. When there are falsehoods that are being presented about the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, we must be bold. That is spiritual warfare. Again, this was a reason why Paul was bold in the severe letter. If you're in 2 Corinthians, let's get a little bit more insight and turn to chapter 13. Let's take a look at... Verses 5 through 10. To so get a little bit more insight as the reasoning for this letter. And he tells these false apostles to test yourself, to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves 
Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Now we pray to God that you do no wrong, not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear unapproved. For we, so, for we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This we also pray for, that, we, that you may be made complete. For this reason I am writing these things while absent, so that when present I need not use severity in accordance with the authority which the Lord gave me for building up, not for tearing down. Again, Paul is being meek here. As Christians, you know, and he's doing this with a completely clear conscience. As Christians, our conscience is extremely active, right? As the scripture says, the conscience is either excusing us or accusing us of something. Friend, when we are coming to the defense of the gospel, our conscience is going to be completely clear because we are fighting for those things that are true. This is really what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 4, 4, where he tells them, look, my, my conscience is clear, right? The reason why I am coming from this point and attacking you is because you are attacking the gospel. And every, every time that you come against the truth, I will come back and my conscience will be clear. Through this entire ordeal, Paul is looked at from these false apostles as one who is really heeding to his own flesh. Who is, in a sense, they're saying that he's acting like an unbeliever. And that's not the case. All these attempts to discredit the apostle are actually showing what is in their own hearts. It's a statement, an accusation made from one who is really outside of the truth. And so go back with me to our main text as we start to turn the corner. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We war according to the flesh. Now, a good question to ask is, how is it that we confront those things that are, that are spiritual that have an effect on the mind? How is it that we battle with these things? How do we war according to spiritual warfare? We war with the truth, and we stand firm in the truth. And we do it with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before we came to, to Christ, whenever there was a, a fleshly attack against us our, before Christ, there was a knee-jerk reaction that we wanted to react according to the flesh. Correct? This side of the cross, now that we know our Lord and Savior, we do not act as such. We do not heed to the flesh. We do not react in such a way because we know that we need different instruments and tools to battle what is called the spiritual warfare against the church. And from an example that we see now, this has been made very clear if you guys have been following anything of what's going on over in Canada with uh, Pastor James Coates, who's actually a graduate from the Master Seminary, and he was in prison, right, for gathering the church and, and preaching the Word of God to them against ordinances that were coming from the political scene, right? What you did not see Pastor James Coates and other faithful pastors do is launch some kind of counterattack in regards to how corrupt these political leaders are, right? Because that would be fighting from the flesh. Instead, what he did from a biblical example is he fought it with the truth. He fought it with the truths that are found in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, friend, we must do the same thing. We don't react to a knee-jerk reaction as we were before. We don't react from a fleshly desire. We do it from the truth. We do it with the gospel, and that gospel is to be proclaimed. We combat falsehood with the truthfulness that is found only in the word of God. Now, in reality, these false apostles in Corinth were being driven by their own sinful desires or greed and pride, corruption and immorality. Paul was not going to be baited by their tactics. Paul called these individuals to submit, to repent, and to submit to the authority of Scripture and to truly follow the truthfulness of the gospel in our Lord. Now, how is it? Here's another example as to how we ought to, to fight these spiritual battles. We, 
Let's go ahead and turn to the epistle uh, of the Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. And here is it's, it's a verse that's really quite clear for us as to how do we engage in such a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6. And you guys know this to be the armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Paul here is writing and he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Anything that is falsehood, that, is, that comes against the truthfulness of scripture, are really schemes of the devil. Even if it comes from a political scene, that's exactly what the source is. In verse 12, it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to do to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all of the saints. And pray on my behalf, the, utterances may be, the utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, in change that in proclaiming it, I might be boldly as I ought to speak. Now, this is, a, this is a great study for you to do, maybe on your own. Um, each one of these is, is in regards to a specific way in which we fight these spiritual battles. And so Ephesians 6, 10 through uh, 20 gives us a great glimpse as to how we ought to gird ourselves and fight this battle uh, for the truth. The moment that we begin to fight a spiritual battle with fleshly desires and fleshly weapons, brethren, we will lose every single time more than that god's name will not be glorified in that at all whatsoever once we heed to fleshly counter attacks that does not bring glory to god our weapons are not human ingenuity they're not human ideology or human methodology we don't use our own wisdom our own eloquence we don't use our own strategies our own plans our own philosophical or psychological speculations if any victory does come from using any one of these tactics, it will be superficial and it's going to be temporary. It will not last. More than this, these tactics cannot save a sinner because they're not fought with the truthfulness of the gospel. Only the gospel can do that. Only the truthfulness of scripture can do that. And at times as we're fighting for the truth, it may seem that we're fighting all by ourselves, right? If you just look throughout the entire church history, there's been a lot of men who have fought almost by themselves. Uh, a good example of this is the Reformation, and from there on forward, uh, a quote from John Knox, uh, the Scottish reformer. He says, with God, man is always in the majority. Always in the majority. If it's just you, and you stand in the truthfulness of Scripture, friend, God is all you need. The truthfulness of the Scripture is all you need. Every, make every man a liar, right? But God is the one who is true. We go back to our main text. We look at verse 4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. For the destruction of fortresses. Some, some translations, I believe, have strongholds there. If your translation says stronghold, that's, that's also... That's also good. It actually fortresses or strongholds comes from a Greek word, uh, kuroma. This was also used actually as an uh, uh, extra biblical terms as a prison or even a tomb. 
So in verse 4, we get that, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. What this is saying that is that all sinners have entrenched themselves with their own ideologies. Everything that has been built up, they've built up their own fortresses. And in a sense, it's been their own prison because it's been built upon their own thoughts, their own opinions, their own reasonings, their own theories, all those things that have come across and against the truthfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is this bad? Because these fortresses are being built from a mind that's already depraved, that's already far away from God, and yet these tactics are being used to build a fortress and enclose themselves into a prison, which eventually will lead into their own tomb, right? These fortresses are built, in a sense, to run away from the one true God. But there's nowhere that you can run to where God won't be. God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at one time. No matter how far they try to run away from these truths that are found in Scripture, even atheists know deep in their heart that God truly exists, and those truths are only found in the testimony of Scripture. And we see that in Romans. Turn with me to the book of Romans. Romans 1. All unbelievers have evidence, right? The, you can see the majesty of our God throughout all of creation. And to look at it and to deny the power and the majesty of our God, there's, there's actually one thing that is happening. And we see that in Romans 18, Romans 1:18, 19 and 20. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness, of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They're suppressing the truth. These fortresses that are being built up in their own mind outside of God, really all that is saying is that you are suppressing the truth when you know very well what the truth is. Verse 19 goes on and says, Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his internal power, and the divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Every man will be left without excuse. Without excuse. <clears throat> we do this as we try to proclaim the gospel to an unbeliever. Um, we come from a presupposition that God already exists, and we know that based on the scriptures. There's no need to level, to come to a level ground with an unbeliever to try to make a case for God. No, friend, God exists, and you have to submit to the truthfulness of what has already been said by him in his word. And so trying to provide some kind of evidence to the existence of God is, in a sense, trying to make a case for something that's already been true, right? If you have already been saved by the precious blood of Christ, the treasures and the secret things that are hidden in Christ have been revealed to you. And every time you try to make an evidence to try to prove the existence of God, you're laying aside those secret things that have been revealed to you to try to level with the unbeliever. Amen. Friend, there is no level ground with an unbeliever. They know the truthfulness of the gospel, but yet as verse 18 tells us, they are suppressing that truth in their own unrighteousness. This really, if you lead this, if you, if you follow this to its natural conclusion, we're led, we're, we're, we're left with two types of people in this world. And we see that, and uh, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 7. When it's all said and done, it really boils down to these two groups of people. <clears throat> Matthew 7, 13 and 14. As our Lord is finishing up this great sermon on the mount, he is calling for all those to repent. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are few, no, many, many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Now, these are two, two roads, two types of people 
in every sense. And if you go to uh, just a few verses down, we see a parable of these two foundations talking about building up fortresses. Let's talk about two builders. We see that in Matthew 7, uh, 24 through 27. And our Lord shares this parable and he says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell. And don't miss this part. And great was its fall. Great was its fall. You know, these two individuals heard the same message, right? They heard the same thing. One decided to build it upon the truthfulness of the rock of Christ, and the other one decided to build it upon his own wisdom and understanding. The person who does that, great will be the fall. It makes something very clear. Our fortress is made up of ideologies, either gets destroyed now and leads us to salvation, or, or that same fortress will come down after we die and it will lead to judgment. Either way, that fortress is going to come down. Pray and call out to the Lord that that fortress comes down now, that you have been leaning on your own understanding, and the truthfulness of the gospel is what you need to be, what you need to be seeking for. Amen. Either way, it will come down, and it will submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me back to our main text. Take a look at verses 5 and 6. And this is the submission to Christ. 5 and 6. Paul really turns the corner now. He says, We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Lofty things here is in regards to any unbiblical system that has been exalted above the truthfulness of the word of God. You know, and you see this every day, right? All these things that are being, uh, that are unbiblical systems. I mean, just look at what, uh, today we're in June now. And I just became aware that June 1st is LGBT. LG T, what is it? I don't even know. It's so many letters now. LGBTQ. I probably said it wrong. That's okay. But these are all worldly, worldly, unbiblical systems that have been exalted in a sense that have come across the truthfulness of Scripture. Friend, they're all around us. They're all around us. The battle that we fight is not against demons personally. It's not that. This battle, it's always been the battle of the mind. It's always been the battle of the mind. A battle for the minds of people who are captive to the lies that is in direct opposition to the word. We are called to avoid such wisdom that is from the world. We are called to avoid those things, to run the other way and run to the truth only found in scripture. Amen. And we see that in 1 Corinthians. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 3. Here's a warning that this church, the church in Corinth, also received in the first letter, verse 18 through 26, uh, 23, in 1 Corinthians 3. It says, Let no man deceive himself. If, if any man among you thinks that he is wise in, his, in this age, he must become foolish, so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, He is the one who who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise. They are useless. So then let no one boast in men, 
For all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Turn with me to Colossians now. Colossians chapter 2. Six through ten it says here, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. Are we seeing that influence now? I mean, just turn on the news, right? Or go to your social media or YouTube. That's exactly what is going, now, going on now. All right, there's this persuasion of these false ideologies. In verse 9, it says, For in him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. It's a simple message, brethren. What we have is a simple message of the gospel. Uh, there is great power in the message of Christ, no matter how simple it is. No matter how simple it is, there is power in this gospel. Turn back with me to 1 Corinthians 1. It's a simple message, but it is, uh, it's usually laughed, laughed at as we go out and evangelize. It's a message that's laughed at. That's okay, because we know that there is power in this message. We see this in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 31. It says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the cleaver I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom but we preach christ crucified to jews a stumbling block and to the gentiles foolishness but to those who are the called both jews and greeks christ the power of god and the wisdom of god because the foolishness of god is wiser than men and the weakness of god is stronger than men for consider your calling brethren that there were not many wise according to the flesh not many mighty and not many not many noble but God, who has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the, des and the despised God has chosen the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God, but God, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who become who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. How about you? Have you been relying on your own wisdom and your own knowledge regarding the things that are eternal? Have you been re relying on the things that you feel that you know that are outside of Scripture? And we've been talking about Paul, and Paul thought that for sure. Let's, let's look at that. Let's go to uh, Philippians chapter 3. Paul was one of these individuals who relied on his own wisdom, his own knowledge, regarding the things that are eternal. It was a false assurance. Philippians 3. <clears throat> 
And he gives an account of this. And he says in Philippians 3, 4 through 11, he says, Although I myself might have confidence in, even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. How about you? Have you been relying on your own works, on your own understanding? There's only one thing that will be a result of that. That is eternal damnation separated from the blessings of God. The scripture tells us that God is completely holy and righteous and he is completely set apart. He is not like men. He is not like you and I. We are completely depraved individuals who have fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us has sinned before a holy and righteous God. And there's one thing that we do deserve in fairness. We deserve eternal judgment in hell forever and ever, even if we only sin one time. You know, the one mistake that we always do is we like comparing ourselves to another person. Well, at least I didn't do this. At least I didn't do that. At least I didn't kill anyone. It doesn't matter. What you ought to be comparing yourself is to the holiness of God who demands perfection. And the only thing that we deserve is eternal judgment in hell. But there's good news. There is good news that even though we deserve judgment, God the Father sent forth His Son and the cesspool of sin on earth lived the perfect and righteous life that you could never live in a million lifetimes. He lived a perfect life that you and I could never live. He was put to death, a death upon a cross. He was beaten and died upon that cross as a substitutionary death for all those who come and believe upon the Lord. <clears throat> and yes, he did die, and on the third day he rose again in power. And there's a reason why he rose again in great power, is because there was no sin found in his life. He was good, perfect, and righteous, and those, therefore sin could not have any, any kind of power over him. He rose on the third day and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is interceding for his bride. And the good news is, is that if you put your full faith and trust upon the Lord that he died in your place, he died a death that you rightfully deserved. There's a beautiful transaction the moment that that happens. The beautiful transaction is the sins that you have committed, past, present, and future, have been laid upon the cross simply by faith. And the perfect righteousness of Christ has now been placed upon your account. Amen. And now you are marked as right standing with God forever and you get to enjoy the blessings of Christ. That is the gospel, friends. That is foolishness to this world. But for us, there's the power for all of us who are being saved. The foolishness of this world loves to seek after the world's wisdom. For us, we seek after the truthfulness of the scripture. Turn with me back to 1 Corinthians in chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. To give you a little bit of a background as far as what's going on here as we get ready to close. Corinth was a huge city. Huge city. There was many philosophers, many well-educated people there. And so they had the best vocabulary around. And so this text is written at that time. And uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, 
says this. Paul says, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of, and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but in the power that is only found in God. Brethren, this is how we destroy speculations and lofty things. We destroy it by standing firm in the presentation, the truthfulness of the gospel. That's how we fight spiritual battles that come against the truth. There is only one objective in this warfare. The objective is that, that we change how people think, right? The objective is repentance, right? To receive the gospel and to repent, to have a new mind, to think differently about the sin that you love, and to think differently about the God that you once hated. You now hate the sin, and now you love the God that you once hated. And so we see this only done through the power of the scriptures, and we see that. Turn with me to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Twelve and thirteen. This is why we battle spiritual. This is why we battle spiritual warfare with the truth. For this reason. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him whom we have to do. Right? All these things are completely known to God. And to do so, we need to know the truth. Right? How, how, can, we, how, we, can, how can we combat falsehood if we ourselves don't know the truth? So I encourage you to study the Word of God relentlessly with diligence, with diligence. And we see that really, we just read Ephesians chapter 6, but in Ephesians 6, our we the weapon of the Christian in the Christian armor is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That is how we combat falsehood against the truthfulness of, of the Gospel. We have to know the truth as well. And so I encourage you to study the Scriptures relentlessly every single day. And now again, closing in uh, the last verse in chapter 10, verse 6 of 2 Corinthians, it says, And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Paul, the Apostle Paul, was extremely calculating. Paul had the authority and the courage to punish disobedience at Corinth and instead decided to show compassion. He also had the discipline to wait until the church was also ready to be obedient. He understood that they weren't quite there yet. But regardless of what the church, uh, of what, regardless of what the church in Corinth thought, Paul was compassionate and courageous and competent when he needed to be. We ought to imitate this example. The counterattack from Paul against false apostles was something that needed to be timed. And we rely on this in Deuteronomy 32, 35. The vengeance belongs to the Lord who will punish his enemies in due time. He will punish all the wickedness in due time. Until then, we are called to the battlefront, brethren. The battlefront is raging hot. And I encourage all of us to do that, to stand in the lines of the battlefront with the truthfulness of the word of the truth of the gospel. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you grateful for your word. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to gather once again to swim in your word. Father, we just ask that these words uh, resonate deep within our heart, that we may bring it up at an opportune, opportune time, that we may be good soldiers of your son, Jesus Christ, that we may be able to combat these things that come across, that come against your truth, Father. Help us do that. And we pray this in your son's name, in Jesus' name.